Greetings, everybody. Uh, thank you for being with us and welcome to Perspectives on Philanthropy. As we search for context in our transforming world, what role does philanthropy play? Broadly understood to encompass the human voluntary spirit, philanthropy is responding in a variety of ways to the current global crisis. How is it doing and what role will it have in the world that is emerging? We are very fortunate today to have as our special guest, Stacy Palmer, editor of the Chronicle Philanthropy. Stacy has served as the chief editor since the Chronicle Philanthropy was founded in 1988 and has overseen the development of its website, philanthropy.com. She plays a hands-on role in many Chronicle services, such, such as its Philanthropy Today daily newsletter and its webinar series offering professional development for people involved in fundraising, grant seeking, advocacy, marketing, and social media. She has appeared frequently on radio and television to offer commentary on news in the nonprofit world. She is the editor of Challenges for Philanthropy and Nonprofits, a book published by the University Press of New England that collects three decades of observations by the nonprofit activist and Chronicle columnist, Pablo Eisenberg. Before she helped found the Chronicle Philanthropy, she was an editor for government and politics at the Chronicle Higher Education. She is a graduate of Brown University where she earned a bachelor's degree in international relations. And she has been an active alumna, serving on numerous alumni boards, including chairing the Brown Alumni Magazine, and is now a member of the university's Women Leadership Council. Stacy, welcome to Perspectives on Philanthropy, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Great. We are keen to engage our audience today. So those of you who have joined us, you'll be able to add your questions into the Q&A uh, section of, uh, of the Zoom facility. But to set the stage, um, I'd like us to talk a little bit about the Chronicle, which I think is the most read, the most read and most widely consulted publication on the nonprofit world. Before we dig into some of the details on how you, Stacy, managed to deliver this vital source of information, let's begin at the very high level, <clears throat> at the 30,000 foot level, and speculate a little bit about the role of media in building our perceptions and our conception of what nonprofits and philanthropy are, are about. After all, often what philanthropy is, is the way we talk about it and write about it. And there's rarely, there really is not a better source uh, than the Chronicle. So let's start at the beginning and ask you about the origin story of the Chronicle. What need was it filling when you decided to start it? Well, you know, I think the Chronicle got started in part because a large number of people came to us and said, the field is beginning to professionalize. Um, and we need some way of sharing information. And we were founded before there was an internet that made it really easy to be able to get information. And it's probably hard to imagine now, given the way we get information, but it was very difficult for people to understand what was going on in the nonprofit world, especially let's say if Congress was talking about charitable deduction legislation, or there were budget cuts that were gonna affect nonprofits at the federal level. How did everybody find out about those things? There wasn't a great news source when there were new foundation executives being appointed. It was just, it took a long time for that information to trickle out. And as the field was beginning to see that it really needed to consolidate and share information, people who were in higher education and knew about the Chronicle of Higher Education said, we need the same thing for nonprofits and foundations. Would you consider that model? And it took us a while to be able to decide that it was the right thing to do. We were always intrigued by it, um, but we were trying to figure out whether we could really make it work. And once we decided we could, we plunged in and we were very excited to be able to cover this field um, and give it the information it needed. And one of the things that pleased me most was a couple of years after we were founded, I went to do a speech at a United Way in Alabama. And the CEO, when he was introducing me, took up a print copy of the Chronicle of Philanthropy and said, I sent this to my mother when it came out because I told her, mom, I have a professional job. We have a professional newspaper. This is the sign of it. And I thought we have accomplished part of our mission right there. That's terrific. So it kind of grew along with the professionalization of, of philanthropy and philanthropy. Absolutely. Many of our first articles debated this issue, of, especially in fundraising, whether it was a profession, um, it, you know, more art, more science. And I know, obviously, the work you all do at the fundraising school is so important. But, you know, really, three decades ago, people were raising the question about whether you could teach fundraisers to be professionals. And of course, I think we now all accept that that is very much and very important. And the fact that you now offer a PhD in philanthropic studies, those kinds of things were not imaginable at that point. Um, and you know, the field really has changed very rapidly um, in terms of professionalizing. 
That's great. Well, absolutely. There's been such huge changes. So let's let's fast forward to uh, today when our new model um, of social media and the internet have changed how we consume information, but also how it's produced and, and how we share or don't share facts and narratives about the world. Facebook, Google, and Apple have eaten the news business. So what does that mean for the Chronicle and kind of the, the way that you're thinking about the uh, philanthropy in the nonprofit world? And so, you know, we love the fact that it makes us more accessible, more relevant to more people. Um, and so we work very hard to keep our website um, informative. It led us to rethink the print publication though. We used to be a bi-weekly newspaper. Um, and as the internet became uh, the way that we provided information more regularly, uh, we decided that it was time to change that format and go to a, a magazine that was filled with big ideas and came out once a month. And we put more of our energy into what we do online. So now we do newsletters. Um, you know, we come out every day. We keep our website up to date. Last night, when the news of the verdict came out, um, the reporters were on the phones. And if any of you in the audience were those people who answered those phones, I appreciate it because we quickly wanted to be able to see what was the response in the nonprofit world and in foundations. Um, and so, you know, we fanned out very quickly get reaction. Those are the kinds of things we can now do that you know, within a couple hours, we had a story posted that was a quick summary of how foundations and nonprofits put out statements. And then this morning we posted a more in-depth look at what people think really is the impact um, and what's next. So you know, the fact that we can move that quickly um, is exciting and the way that we use the website to provide information. And the magazine is more of a place when, you know, you want to take some time to really, you know, lean back and think about things. And some people consume us both ways, but most people have a preference. Either they love print or they love online, and they don't necessarily mix all that much. Yeah, that's. I I saw the newsletter come this morning uh, with uh, the kind of the, the fresh off the press analysis of the of the Chauvin uh, verdict. But I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it's you know it's something. It's part of my daily consumption of what's going on. So. I really appreciate that. But the business is also transforming in certain ways in, 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 in terms of nonprofit models of, of, of news gathering coming out, billionaires owning um, publications like the Washington Post. Um, how is that changing the, the way that you're covering the nonprofit world and, and some of the, 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 the changes that that's meant for you? Yeah, I, you know, it is a really exciting development to watch um, what is going on in journalism in terms of philanthropists thinking about buying newspapers. We see that. I don't know that it's going to end up working as if you're following the details of the Alden purchase with the Chicago Tribune, the Baltimore Sun, those kinds of things. But philanthropists are really weighing in to think about rescuing the local news business. And it's very important that they do that. So we've been covering that area much more as a field because it's become so much more important to the world of philanthropy. And perhaps we can talk more about you know, that a little bit later. Um, but in terms of how it's changed things for us, you know, there are a lot of nonprofit news organizations that are getting started. So we're watching what they're doing. And I think they're really redefining how you think about your audience. Um, many of them are much closer to the people that they serve. For example, you know, many of them, when they were reporting on the trouble that their communities were having getting vaccinations, they didn't just do a story that said, you know, there's inequity in the way vaccinations are being rolled out. They helped sign up people in the community and said, we're gonna show you how to get something, you know, and we're gonna play that role of helping and providing a service in addition to our reporting. So I think it's really changing the way journalists think about their audiences. And I think that's a change for the better is that we're getting much closer to the people that we serve and thinking about it that way rather than journalists are on high and removed and we you know, don't think about our audience. When I came into the field, it was much more that way that we would declare, you know, we talked to a bunch of experts and the headline would come out and we would stand back a little bit. That's not the way anymore. Um, and I think readers really appreciate it as journalists are becoming much more serious parts of the community. That's fascinating and kind of relates to um, Something I read a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, the the proposed new digital strategy for the Wall Street Journal, which which still has a, a very large print publication. But if you read their content strategy that the New York Times covered, it seems that they're moving away from that and see the future as being much more digitally focused because the public the public the 
the publication is only read by relatively old people like me and we're not going to be around we're not going to be around that much longer and and the digital world allows you to be as you were saying so close and so responsive because you can track all of these metrics in kind of in in, in detail in terms of people the way people are consuming your uh, your work that you weren't able to when it was a uh, 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 purely uh, print so is is what what's going to happen to your magazine in the future is that going to wither away and become also online how are you thinking about oh, kind of we the, deliver it online as well so if you want to just read the magazine online you can do that um, even today you know five or six years ago i predicted to my colleagues that i thought print was going to go away and that we wouldn't be doing it anymore and yet it's still going strong there are people who really love to just have that collection of materials they like the feel of print um, and they find it easier to read. And so we'll continue to serve that as long as that's something that people really right. want to be able to read. Um, but we know that digital is the way that, you know, more of our, more and more people, especially during the pandemic, you know, we're a publication that is a professional publication. Many people used to receive it in their offices. Uh, so, you know, many people asked to have their subscriptions rerouted to them at home. But you know, it did change the consumption habits. And so we have people you know, who make sure that all of their employees have access to the Chronicle online, for instance, rather than um, you might remember some of our older readers will remember being routed around. You know, and sometimes people would call and say, I have a correction on an article that was three months old. And I would say, why are you just calling us now? And they were the last on the routing slip to see our article. Um, and so what I love obviously now is everybody has access right away. Um, hopefully we don't, try not to make mistakes, but sometimes we do and we need people to call attention to that. Um, but you know, it, it, it's much more accessible to more people. And that's the part that we love about the online access. The other thing online does is it allows us to give a more tailored view of the world. Um, so if you're a fundraiser or a grant maker, if you care about the environment, you care about the arts, that we can give you the information that you are especially looking for. Um, and that's one of the areas that we're working to get much better on. Our role is to bring foundations, fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, board members, policymakers, everybody involved in the nonprofit enterprise together. Um, because we really do feel that there's not enough communication. This field is very siloed, even still. You know, I said that that was why we were founded. I think we still need to work at that. So we will always want to be a big tent that brings people together. But everybody has a job to do. And what you might need to do today is very different than what one of your colleagues, let's say, in the development office might need to do in here. So, you know, we want to be able to bring you information the way you want it in the size that you want it, it might not be text, it might be video, it might be audio. There are other ways that people want to get information. So as we look forward to what digital allows us to do, it's much more tailored information. So I think that's wonderful. And it's wonderful that we don't have to fill out those little uh, uh, routing splips and pass things <laughs> along wrong. Uh, some of our younger colleagues might need a, a little bit reminder of why, why we used to do that. But so the tailoring is is kind of very clear, and the metrics you can get, you know, what people are are reading and watching, and how you can respond to that. And you mentioned that there was this hierarchical sense of the editor being the one who declares what should be watched. But but do you do you miss or do you think there's an element of that discretion that we might lose if we're an, an ability to use the perspective of somebody like you and your colleagues who have the overall view of things and and can point to uh, areas of context and perspective that people might miss if if we're simply feeding them exactly what they think they need immediately. Yeah. Immediately. So, is how do you still maintain some of that discretion as an editor that I, I think some of us find valuable? Yeah, one of the things that's important to us is to, is to expose people to things they might not think they care about or don't need to know. Um, so certainly that's why we provide a package of material. So our Philanthropy Today newsletter, for example, every day tells you the kinds of things you need to read about, not only in our pages, but elsewhere online. We, you know, somebody scours um, the whole, as much as they can find online, you know, to be sure that we're providing lots of different kinds of information that you really might need to do your job, or you, you might just plain be interested and enjoy reading. One of the things about our financial model that makes that easier to do is, you know, we're not driven by clicks. Um, we're really driven by subscriptions. And so we're building a relationship with our readers. Um, you need to find something valuable that is valuable enough 
often enough that you know you find things to read and that it's worth a subscription. But it's not as though we're just driven by advertising clicks um, or those kinds of things. So we're a little bit removed from that need to feel that you know it has to be you know a clickbait article or a headline that just grabs you. We don't do that kind of thing. For sure, we need to be found online, and you know you'll see you know some of the ways we write headlines sometimes are to be able to make sure that the search engines finds us. You know, so you'll often see a lot of how to do this because search engines love that. So that's the way in which you know maybe we tailor our information to the needs of online. But you know, I think we feel fortunate that we haven't really had to go completely to that model of what the public feels is popular. So, you know, we don't do a lot of celebrity news, for example, or any of those kinds of things, even though it probably would draw a lot more clicks. <laughs> That's fascinating. And I, I certainly value the, the scouring that you do that, you know, gives you a sense of how the mainstream press is, is cutting into our field occasionally. And those are, those are wonderful. And I sometimes wish I had more time so I could follow all of them, but I, I, I rarely do. So tell us what what is it that that you know attracts the most attention um, for the Chronicle and philanthropy.com is it is it the philanthropy 50 what 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 gets people really um, uh, uh, excited and 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 um, uh, uh, and and come to your website and and attracts a lot of readers. There's a wide range of things especially during this year of crisis um, we have found the consumption of news and information um, has just skyrocketed. And so, you know, in the worst of the pandemic, when we were all really trying to figure out what does this mean, um, we would see, you know, people coming to our website on Saturday mornings um, and this traffic would shoot up. It was higher than it was during a typical week in terms of people wanting information about what's Congress doing? What should I be doing for my organization? What are other people doing? How do I respond? So. It's been you know, very much targeted to how people respond to the various crises of the past year. That said, you, know, you mentioned our Philanthropy 50, which ranks the people who give the most to charity every year. Our data projects, and we've always invested a lot in those, are very popular with readers because it gives them access to information that's not available anywhere else. We spend an enormous amount of time gathering information um, and especially, you know, when you're looking at things like how the very wealthy give, that information isn't available. You can't, you know, just go quickly look at a 990 to find all of that information, unfortunately. Um, and it's the relationships that my colleague Maria Demento has formed with um, so many wealthy people, wealth advisors, that allows us to bring that. So that is very popular. Um, we also do rankings of how much charities raise each year. The, those are popular as well. And so anything we can do that looks at data, um, we did an in-depth look at the demographic makeup of charity leaders, for example, at the 100 biggest organizations. We did that before the racial reckoning happened to really call attention to the fact that really nonprofits are not doing as well as they should be in terms of diversity of leadership. Those are the kinds of things that we continue to do every year to say, are we making any progress? Mm -hmm. Well, that's terrific, and we certainly appreciate that because you know we're, we're I think partners in the in the realization that still there's still not enough data and enough information about exactly what it is what it is that we do um, in 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 this world. Well, is there an example of something that you thought would be much more uh, accepted and and engaged by readers that didn't come that that didn't succeed as much as you anticipated? think there's been anything that's really shocked us um, in terms of people not being receptive to it. It does, it has quirks. So, you know, what we tend to be affected by is, is there something else going on in the world? You know, um, and certainly during the Trump presidency, there was something going on in the world all the time. Um, and so sometimes we would hold back on some of our best pieces because we knew that nobody had time or bandwidth to pay attention to it. So, you know, coming back to sort of a newer normal now, not to say that things are easy, but the fact that you're not having the crisis du jour that was taking away, nonprofit leaders needed to respond to so many of those things and foundation people so fast that there was no way they would have time to read information on other subjects. So what we can feel is there's, you know, more time for them to absorb things on other topics now. Um, and, you know, I think we're really pleased that we're able to get into some other areas rather than that immediate 
you know, respond to the very moment of things that are happening, even though that's a crucial role for us, there also is a lot else going on in the world. Right, right. Providing more context, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So like, like many other news operations, um, uh, the Chronicle and philanthropy.com uh, have established new business lines like events and training programs that we mentioned in your introduction. Uh, how are they structured and, and how are they doing and how do they connect to the journalism that you do? And yeah. Where are they going? So, One of the things that has always distinguished us, um, and we learned this really early on, although we were founded to provide journalism and news coverage, what people loved about our articles was that we provided a lot of how-to information, you know, that really helped fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, trustees figure out what they were going to do. We often, you know, would put on our front page a section that we called How They Do It, that really took you through a case study of what an organization was doing. Um, and just, you know, especially when we started, those kinds of things were not as easily available. There's more of that today, but there was not as much of it. And so we always knew that service journalism was a very important piece of what we do, helping our readers navigate things. Um, so we decided uh, 10 years ago to bring that live um, and bring some of the experts that we were talking to um, into our webinar series. What we do is usually we have people who have at their organizations made a giant difference. So we bring people who are great, let's say at annual funds or ahead of Giving Tuesday, we'll talk about giving days and people who have had smashing success at their own organizations, they share peer to peer. Here's how we did it. Here's what it took. We usually have a large organization, a small organization. Sometimes we invite grant makers and donors to share what are the things that they care most deeply about. What do they wanna see in a proposal or a pitch? So we see our role as bringing that view of the world to as many people as possible. Um, and we have found that a very successful thing. During the downturn that we have all faced um, in the past year, one of the things we realized too is that we needed to go beyond the webinar series and do very quick live briefings that responded to the crises of the day. So within a couple of weeks of the shutdowns that we all faced, we convened a panel of experts that helped nonprofits really navigate the different things that they needed to do. We made that freely available. And then we continue doing that. Um, and we've done a lot more live journalism on to topics from the racial reckoning, the threats to democracy. Um, we looked at how watchdog organizations work. We do all kinds of things that are either very timely or in many ways help people do their jobs. One of my favorites, um, was with Melanie Lundquist, who is a giving pledge level donor, um, who said she was very concerned that she did not feel that all of her peers were necessarily giving as much as they could. And she wanted to help our audience be equipped with the tools that they needed to do their jobs better so that they could reach out to other affluent people. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we bring to people in the format very much like what we're doing now, um, where we get to talk to you rather than having to read a lot of text. Um, I think. People want much more of that kind of thing. And then they can ask their own questions as well. And that's a very popular thing. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll get to audience questions. So I see a couple of questions already in, in the Q&A box. Please add yours and we'll get to them soon. Uh, before we go to substance, one last question on kind of the, the journalism business. So um, I, I always ask... Uh, uh, when I'm interviewing people, kind of what, what they read and, and to keep abreast of the field. And usually the Chronicle is you know, the, the first thing that people mention that you've got to read this. Except at our 30th anniversary, we had a, um, we had a foundation leader who said, you know, I, I don't read the Chronicle of Philanthropy because it's all about fundraising. So how do you balance that? How do you engage that? What role does fundraising play in your identity? And you just mentioned Melanie Lundquist kind of coming from the giving side, but engaging fundraisers at the same time. Is that, is that uh, how, uh, how do you put that in context? Yeah, fundraising is clearly a really important part of what we cover. And because we're trying to connect people in the grant making world to the nonprofits that are raising money to help make sure that they're very smart about that. And obviously we do things other than um, look at foundation giving. So we'll write about plan giving or other kinds of things as well. Um, but a large part of our readership, they're not necessarily all fundraising professionals. Some of them may be chief executives who have to do a lot of fundraising. Anybody who's in the nonprofit enterprise needs to think about fundraising. So that's why we cover it so much. Um, and there isn't as much information out there that is timely. So, you know, what we'll do is say, you know, this is the new thing that Foundation X or Y or Z is into to help 
grant seekers understand that. So it's an important role. I, I am not surprised to hear what you said about um, the person who made that comment. I do think that what I hear from many grant makers is that it is crucially important that they understand what it's like to be a fundraiser and that they are in touch with the needs of philanthropists. Uh, they're in touch with the needs of the nonprofits that they support. Um, so, you know, we hope that it gives them access to what is it that the struggles that nonprofits have, especially in this day, um, where we've seen such challenges that nonprofits face with soaring need to fund their services. It's very important that those voices come together and that foundation people are listening to what nonprofits are saying. That said, if you don't have to worry about running an annual fund, you probably don't want to read that. And I expect that you should turn the page and maybe that's not what you should do. But that's one of the reasons when I talked about the need for us online to be able to segment, we do want to be able to say, here, you know, if you're working as a program officer, these are some of the kinds of stories you would find most interesting. And if you want to go into some other areas, you have access to doing it. Um, that's easier to do online than it is in a print publication that has a finite amount of space. Um, so I hear that complaint um, and I hope we can balance things in a way that overcomes that. But really, I would say the message to philanthropy is that um, it's important that we all understand the financial challenges that nonprofit leaders face. They're immense and they've done such an amazing job in this very scary year. Absolutely. Uh, everybody's been scrambling. But so the, is, have you seen success through the digital um, the, the digital flat platforms in terms of being able to kind of tailor content for different audiences? Are you seeing success in that area? We are working um, to do better on that. We have, we've made some progress in that area, but we're building some new things on our website that will make it even easier for people to be identified and we know more about what it is that you're reading, not by spying or any of those kinds of things, but when you register with us, we know that you're a foundation official, for example. So we'll serve up more of those stories. We'll probably spin out some newsletters very soon that are more targeted on specific causes. Um, we already have fundraising updates. Some of you may subscribe to it. It'll come out a little bit later today. It comes out once a week, but especially for fundraisers, but we'll do some other things that serve grant makers um, and look at things like you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which there's enormous informational needs in that area. So really tailoring things to what it is people need. You know, it might be climate change is an incredibly important area that people want access to more information. So you'll see more of that coming out from us in the year ahead. Fascinating, fascinating what you can do digitally. So so let's talk about the, the, the pandemic and, and the social earthquakes that it has caused in terms of questions that you just mentioned in terms of race and equity. And you, it, it's, it's amazing to see how much information and, and news that you, you guys have been able to serve up in response. Um, what have you learned uh, in terms of that pivot and, and, and what we're learning about race and equity issues? And uh, uh, wh where do you think this is going? What, what element of this do you think is, is going to last and, and become a permanent issue for philanthropy? Yeah, I mean, in both the pandemic and on the racial issue, the question is really what is coming next and how much will last? And I certainly think that what we've seen on race, um, it really made the nonprofit world recognize that we were lagging in so many ways. Um, and I think all of us feel that, you know, things should have been done differently a long time ago um, and that we needed to diversify our organizations, the people who work for them. It's a very important thing to do. That's one reason we've always been charting that kind of thing is to look at that. We took our own look at the diversity of our sources, for example, and wanted to see who is it that we talk to. Um, and we were fortunate to receive a grant from the Hewlett Foundation that allowed us to analyze, you know, both by race, gender, geography. We looked at, you know, are we talking to more boomers or millennials um, and can we do better in those areas? Um, and so we're using that as a baseline to understand where it is that we need to improve. And the reporters are making a dedicated effort to work from their own baselines to make sure that they're reaching out to more people um, to get a fuller view of things. So I think, you know, what we certainly heard yesterday um, as we were covering the reaction to the verdict is a great deal of concern that perhaps some of these gains, you know, people might feel that it's time to step back um, in some ways that the verdict might send a message that, you know, maybe we don't need to be as active on things like police reform. And certainly the message from everybody we spoke to was, this is the time to, you know, really put on the gas and say, this is incredibly important. We're still seeing, um, 
you know, awful acts happening um, of, you know, people of color being killed by police, we need to pay attention to this. You know, so I think these issues will continue, but there definitely is a concern that it might wane in various ways. Um, and so the activists are putting a lot more attention into saying, we need to keep going. Um, There's also a lot of reaction to the statements that came out yesterday of people feeling like a statement isn't enough. You need to see action. Um, so I think foundations and nonprofits are going to see many more demands to prove what they're doing, to prove what they're doing is making a difference. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of activists who are also calling attention to the fact that we know nonprofits led by people of color have gotten a lot less money over time um, than very comparable groups led by white people. Um, and so, you know, those demands are going to continue um, of people looking at what's the makeup of the group sort in that philanthropy supports. Um, so I, I expect, um, especially foundations, to see a lot more scrutiny of what they're doing. Um, and that's going to last. I, I, I don't think that's going to go away at all. Yeah, certainly. And I think there's also more research to bringing light to the fact that there have been these lasting inequities that we haven't really been paying attention to as well. So let me turn a little bit to, to research. And, and you certainly cover uh, research in this sector at the same time as, as you mentioned, the important data gathering that you do as well. Um, and, and so in terms of uh, your perspective, you know, what are some of the most um, important pieces of research uh, that you think um, resonate the most with your um, with your audience? And, and perhaps to that end, you, you may speak to this new partnership that you have with the AP and the conversation that the conversation is a is, is a nonprofit that that digs into university research and, and trying to bring it more more make research more uh, accessible to people, but also connecting it to the AP and, and the world outside of our our familiar bubble uh, of all the people who already read the Chronicle. Right? Good. I'd love to talk about that. Let me first answer your question about research and then I'll come back to the AP partnership because it's very important for people on this call to know about because we would love to hear your story ideas um, because there are now more journalists covering philanthropy than ever before. Um, so I have exciting news to share on that. In terms of the research, and we are so grateful for the work that the Lilly School does um, because there just is not enough research in this field. Um, and I would say the reason we do our own is that feeling that we all need to do more looking at the data. But what I would say is hugely important that you've helped us understand is first of all, the insights into women donors. And we're so grateful that there's research that looks at the differences um, of female donors. So that's been incredibly important. Also, you know, another area that's been very important and we've seen this during the pandemic, perhaps um, coming on the upside, but the slippage of middle-class donors um, and the studies that you've done that have helped point out what's going on with the drop in the number of middle-class people who are giving, you know, it started during the Great Recession, being able to chart that, um, because that could really shake up the whole nonprofit world. If we don't have, you know, if, it, if more, more Americans are not giving, we need those everyday givers to feel that philanthropy is for them that they are shaping the agenda of nonprofits. I don't think any of us want the whole world um, to be supported just by the billionaires. Um, that, that probably won't give the money to the food banks and to the other kinds of organizations that need them. And it's not the way philanthropy should work. So it's incredibly important that you, know, you have data that's able to show that. Um, so those are some of the things that strike me the most. I will say too, um, you, know, about, you asked me about this partnership with the Associated Press and I'm, really grateful that um, the Lilly Endowment provided us major support to be able to enhance public understanding of the nonprofit world. Uh, and that's the whole goal of this grant. So the Associated Press has hired an editor and a reporter. We have done the same. Ours just started this week. I'm very excited um, to have new talent. That means four new journalists have been added to cover the nonprofit world and to really elevate the attention that the public gets about nonprofits. I don't think most people understand how nonprofits work. They don't understand philanthropy. They, as soon as they learn more about it, they want to engage and they love those kinds of stories. And it, you know, often hearing about the work that nonprofits do makes them want to give and volunteer and do things. But as local journalism has been decimated by all of the things that we've seen recently, coverage of the areas that nonprofits care about, education, healthcare, so many issues. There are not reporters, especially in local communities, talking about what's going on. Um, and philanthropy plays such an important role in every city and town. 
So there needs to be much more of a spotlight on that. So that's one of the areas we are working toward. Um, and one of the things that you know this partnership allows, you mentioned the conversation, that brings the scholars together. Um, and their whole mission is to bring scholarship to public attention. They work with scholars to shape their ideas in ways that are publicly accessible. So more of the research on philanthropy, for example, can get shared in a great way. Um, and you know, so between the scholarship, the journalism attention, we hope that we will be able to elevate public understanding of the nonprofit world. Now, proving that is going to be difficult. And all of you in the audience who are impact and evaluation experts, I hope you'll help us think hard about how we prove that we're changing minds. But we definitely believe that more coverage is incredibly important, especially in this moment where we're really counting on nonprofits and foundations to bring about a more equitable reset and recovery. It, it's a crucial moment for them to get attention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it was a wonderful idea when I first heard about it, and I'm glad you're in the steps of implementing it. And we, we look forward to, to seeing more uh, kind of thoughtful and uh, pers uh, perspective filled coverage in, in, the, in, the, in the mainstream press that isn't always simply looking at scandals and, and, and eye popping large gifts and, and how can, can they possibly be uh, legitimate. Um, those kind of stories we have too many of. So it'd be wonderful to see how this par partnership um, moves forward. So, but um, speaking about you know the the big eye popping gifts of which there seem to be more as as there seems to be more wealth concentration yeah. uh, in our country as well. Um, from your background, you you came up in in the world of uh, journalism through on the policy side and. And even before the pandemic, we've had a lot of discussions about the influence of billionaires, not only in philanthropy, but especially in philanthropy in, in society more broadly. And, and there was the progressive quip that, you know, having billionaires is a policy fa failure, meaning that it's something, it's kind of a social failure that we, we would generate people of such disproportionate wealth and such disproportionate power. So as, as you look to the future and, and think about kind of the, the big P, policy in terms of government regulation, which you cover as well, as well as the, the smaller P policy of people sharing best practices across our sector. Where do you think this, this increasing scrutiny of, of concentrated wealth is going? Yeah, I, I, you know, I certainly think it's intense now because people have seen this great gap in wealth and the focus is on, you know, are wealthy people doing enough in this pandemic to help nonprofits and meet more urgent needs. And you certainly see things like um, the efforts that um, the initiative to accelerate giving, for example, that some people may know about. The philanthropist John Arnold is working with Ray Madoff at Boston College to advance this idea that people should be encouraged to give more and they should be encouraged to give more now. There are a number of efforts to um, make sure that the wealthy think about giving more while they're alive and get that joy out of giving and knowing that um, you can really make a difference. And so the question is, you know, should it be forced giving? Um, should there be an encouragement of that? Or is it peer pressure that's needed? Certainly we see things like the giving pledge helping on that. I think those efforts are gonna continue. Um, I think it's very important for nonprofits to think about you know, what they wanna weigh in on in terms of these policy proposals as Congress is thinking about it, whether there is more regulation needed or not. There are widely different views on that topic as to whether regulation is a good idea, but it's certainly an issue of debate and it's important for anybody who cares about charitable giving to look at the proposals and think about how their organization would change or benefit and what's really needed for the country. So I, you know, I, I think we're gonna see a lot of discussion about that. You might have seen that Vox just did a look at a poll of how Americans think about philanthropy and the very rich. Um, and while there was a great concern about the um, impact that billionaires are having on politics um, and certainly concerns about the wealth accumulation during the pandemic, there was a view that philanthropists themselves um, were doing a good job. And people were especially appreciative of some of the work that Bill Gates has done, for example, on vaccines. Bill and Melinda Gates were early on warning us that there was a pandemic coming, they were ready to go. Um, and thinking about these things very early on, and that's why I think we saw such a fast response. That's the kind of thing that you know philanthropy has to do. So you know, I think that while we see a lot of the critique of the billionaires, there's also an appreciation of those who have given that they're making a difference. I think what most people would like to see is more of the wealthy giving 
when we do our Forensic 50 that looks at the people who give the most, one of the things we always look at is how many of them are on the Forbes 400. And usually about half of the people on the list of who gave the most are among those billionaires. That means that a lot of the other billionaires, usually 375 of them, are not giving enough, not giving as much as people who are much less affluent. So why is that? Um, you know, and I think part of our job collectively, probably all the people on this call, is to help people of wealth understand that there are tremendous needs, inform them more about the great work that needs to be done. Um, I believe they would give more if they saw more activity, more results, more of the kinds of things that we know nonprofits are doing in their communities. That's why we think journalism is so important. I know it will encourage more people to give if we can just get the results of philanthropy out to a wider network. That's, that's yeah, I think that's that's certainly a really important hypothesis. And uh, I think, um, uh, but it, it's happening in a context that brings up another P, uh, that one of polarization. Yes. Um, of polarization. And uh, so how is that affecting your coverage of philanthropy? Because philanthropy is not immune to some of these issues. And and uh, I'll, I won't, I'll skip ahead to a question by Les Linkowski in our question and answer um, box. And, 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 you know, he talks about the the discussion of the, about the political and ideological biases of the so-called mainstream media and your kind of your identity as a potentially you know mainstream to progressive leaning place and how do you remain fair and balanced or can you even be try to be fair and balanced in this kind of polarized world? That's a great question. I'm glad Les is on. I think many of you may know he's been a longtime columnist for us and has helped teach us a great deal about philanthropy. So we really appreciate that. Um, I have to say, especially in the past year. Um, anytime we write about anything that is the least bit political, um, we just get an avalanche of reaction. And that's part of how I can feel the polarization being different than it was maybe 10 years ago. Not to say that we wouldn't touch things off when we talked about politics, but now when we do, um, I just get an enormous reaction. I, the part that troubles me is just the inability of people of conservative and liberal views to be able to listen to each other. And I'm very pleased by some of the philanthropists who are themselves really trying to help heal some of these divides. Um, we're gonna do a story in a few weeks that um, will shed light on you know, a major philanthropic effort that is doing just that. Um, and I think it's incredibly important. I think you know, people are struggling just to even have conversations with each other about issues. Um, and yet it's vitally important. Uh, there are people who, when we, cover anything about the threats to democracy, which is something that a lot of foundations have written about, thought about, you know, foundation CEOs have taken to our pages to say, you know, we need to protect that area, um, it's, it is under threat. And I will still get people who will write to me and say, you're a nonprofit that, you're an organization that focuses on fundraising. Why are you writing about politics? That's not important to us. And our democracy is crucial to how nonprofits operate um, without, you know, the protections of our democracy, the whole reason nonprofits have their ability to speak out and have the privileges that they have, the freedom of association comes from the constitution. We, we all have an interest in protecting that. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't envy you being in that position, but it, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear kind of your experience of, of the, the whirlpool we all find ourselves in, in terms of politics today. So before I turn to Ashlyn Devine, who is our student who will begin the um, opening of the question period, let me ask you uh, to speculate with us, realizing that we're in all of these constraints right now uh, in terms of resources. But imagine a world where you had no resource constraints and you could cover the, the great, the, the questionable and the ugly of philanthropy. What would you be doing if you had kind of unlimited resources to be able to improve our understanding and, and the general public's understanding of what our world is all about? Uh, that, that's easy because I think about that all the time of what, what could we do with more? And you know, what we do is very people driven. So you know, the ability to add journalists who can you know, augment our understanding of the world is incredibly important. So when we look at what's next, we're looking at things like adding more reporters who can do explanatory stories, who can dig deep into things. You might've seen a piece we did recently about um, Michael Bloomberg's campaign on vaping. And you know, a reporter spent three months looking into this issue. Mark Gunther is the reporter, many of you may have seen his work. He really had to understand the science of the issues and the scientists totally do not agree. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. 
Um, and he had to sort all of that out and talk to numerous experts to be able to understand whether the strategy that a major philanthropic effort had engaged in made sense. Those are the kinds of stories we want to do more often. They take a lot of time and resources and expertise. So that's probably an area we'll go into. We're also investing a lot more in our opinion section, really trying to get voices from the grassroots. Um, people who work for nonprofits, um, not many of them have people who can help them with their writing and spend time on it. If you're running an organization 24 seven, you don't have a lot of time to sit down and write an opinion piece, but your views probably would shape the world in a wonderful way. So we wanna find ways to help make that process easier for people who have things that they wanna say that will work with them you know, on shaping the arguments and putting it into a form that other people will want. And then they can use that um, essay that they write for us in other places as well. So we're really looking to expand that area. Um, and you know, this partnership that we're doing with the Associated Press is just the beginning. Um, our new editor for partnerships who started this week, Sandra Hahn, is going to be looking at other places we can collaborate. So, you know, might we do something with Chalkbeat or, you know, that covers education or the Marshall Products that covers criminal justice. We'll be looking at various ways that we can extend our reach um, and make sure that everybody who's interested in the issues that philanthropy cares about has access to information about how philanthropy works. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful. I think there's just so much wisdom and, and knowledge embedded in the leadership of our nonprofit sector and teasing that out and bringing it and sharing it with others. That would be a wonderful thing to do. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that, how that pans out. So let's turn to Ashlyn Devine. Ashlyn, would you uncover yourself and please ask your question and introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashlyn Devine. I'm in my second year um, of the bachelor's program with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Um, I just want to say thank you, Stacey, for providing all of that fascinating information um, for us. Um, and because you're so immersed in the field, I was just curious. Um, of course, you know, there have been studies showing that along with declining trust in government and the other sectors, there's increasingly declining levels of trust in philanthropy and nonprofit institutions. And I know, of course, the Chronicle has done some reporting on this. Would you say that this declining trust is one of the biggest problems facing the sector today? And what is some advice you have in regards to strengthening trust in philanthropy once again? Thanks for asking that question. That is something that is very near and dear to us. We cover that a lot because we think that that's an issue that hasn't gotten as much attention as probably it should among nonprofit leaders about what it is they can do about it because I think there's much they can do. I wanna preface this by saying that trust in the media is always much lower than in nonprofits. So, you know, I, I need to be careful about, you know, when I talk about this issue, uh, but, you know, I still think that, you know, what we're seeing after the pandemic is a bit of an uptick in the trust in nonprofits. People who are hearing more about what nonprofits are doing, I mean, you can't help but see the people who are working at food banks across the country you know, there's been a great deal of coverage of that, of the amazing CEOs and volunteers who are making things happen 24 hours a day and doing that kind of thing. That is helping people say, that's part of the nonprofit world that I support, that I know, and that is making a difference. So I, I do think there's been an uptick and I think some of the research shows that, but we need to continue to do more of that. And a lot of the challenge is that nonprofits are not always good at telling their own stories about showing what it is, how they've made a difference, in part because they're doing the work. And that's the wonderful thing. Of course, that's where they should focus their time. Um, but um, that's why we want to put this spotlight much more on what nonprofits are accomplishing um, and show that you know, there are nonprofits in every community that are solving major problems. The more people know about that, the more they will have trust in these organizations but we also need to talk about the names of the organizations, the people who fuel them, not just talk about climate change, but who's doing something to fight climate change? Why are they making a difference and who is doing that? Um, so, you know, I think the more we can call attention without, you know, it being a fluffy kind of thing, I, you know, to say, here's what makes a difference, that will, will do a lot. When people can come back to volunteering, that will help a lot because people can see in person what a nonprofit does. But one of the great things about the pandemic has been all these virtual events where, you know, I can go online and gain access to things across the country, around the world. For the nonprofits that I care about, I have spent more time seeing more of their information, learning more about their programs, because 
it didn't take me getting on a plane to have to go see something, you know, on the campus of my alma mater, for example, much as I would love to do that, but I have access to that in my living room. And so, you know, I hope that those are the kinds of things we continue to do even once we can gather in person, because I think that constant interaction is what leads to more trust. Wonderful. Well, this is this is related to trust in some way. If uh, Amy Neugebauer is asking, uh, can you speak to the democratization of philanthropy? Does your work attract a broader audience now that there is much more participatory grant making, everyday grant making? Yes, um, you know, I think as people are changing the way, you know, the nonprofit world has changed tremendously. It's not all organized nonprofits. We've certainly seen this rise in mutual aid networks, for example, during the pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, informal kinds of giving are expanding our idea of what charity is. Certainly the um, interest in giving cash directly we've seen as a major area of coverage. That's not something philanthropy would have considered traditionally before. I mean, it really took a major change. Um, so I think we are seeing a great expansion of who's thinking about philanthropy, who's engaged in the enterprise, and also what it is that everybody can do to make a difference. So, you know, we do feel that democratization for sure. Um, you know, and obviously what we're trying to reach is, is many of the people who are professionally engaged in the field. Um, and fortunately, I think many of them are, you know, young people who are excited about the possibilities of social change and very eager to make a difference. Um, and so we see that in our demographics as well. That's great. Do you seeing a kind of change in your demographic, demographics in terms of the average age of the folks who are following you as a result of recent changes? Yeah, certainly online, you know, and I think as we talked about earlier in the conversation, print readers do tend to be older, although I have heard from many print readers when I say that, um, you know, that they actually really feel it's, it's something about, you know, I've, I've talked to 20 somethings who will say, when I saw it in the print publication, I took it more seriously and thought it was more important. It really spoke to me that you decided that was important in print. So, you know, I don't want to stereotype about that, but, you know, we definitely are attracting a younger audience online as well. Yeah, I'm hoping there's kind of a return, you know, my, my 21 year old started buying vinyl records and listening <laughs> to vinyl records. So, so maybe there'll be a kind of a, a return to print as a, um, a retro thing, which would be wonderful from my dinosaur perspective. Um, but uh, speaking of, uh, you know, there's another question also in terms of how do you balance the speed of reporting with the need to have rigor and, and perspective. So how do you how do you balance that? How do you come up with something um, on, on the Chauvin verdict that's going to be kind of both timely and also uh, journalistically rigorous? Yeah. And, you know, so what we often need to do is, you know, we'll do that first or second day reaction and response. But we were already at work on a package of looking at, you know, what difference um, has been made since the protests that erupted at the end of May. And you know, so we're already doing that long look and you'll see a series of stories where we're asking you know, what kinds of things did make a difference. The thing that we are fortunate about is because you know, we have a staff that can balance both of those things. So we can do a little bit of both. We never have as much time. So when I get all those resources that you just promised me, Amir, when I look at my abundant world in which I can add more journalists, you know, I think you know, it would be more in the long, insightful kinds of things. And you know, I would put my investment of more people in that kind of thing versus the breaking news. But the breaking news is really important in part because some of these things just would not get covered otherwise and people would not know about important developments. So we'll always give that um, really a prominent role. Great. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Sandra Swirsky. Storytelling about the scope of the sector and its impact is important to reach lawmakers and regulators too. Is there talk of a newsletter from the Chronicle that would be targeted at that audience? We would love to be able to influence policymakers, and that is a great idea. And I appreciate hearing that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that one of the reasons we want to dig into some of these stories about how philanthropy is making a difference um, is to really be able to show policymakers those kinds of things. I don't think they hear stories very often about, you know, what have some of these big gifts accomplished? And often we, when we dig deep and look at, you know, something, a gift that was made five years ago, everybody, there's always a lot of hoopla when $500 million was given to this, but nobody comes back and says, well, what was done with that 500 million? Um, and so, you know, I think, 
providing those results, showing what's happened. Our readers are hungry for it, but I think lawmakers need to know what a difference things have made. Also, I think it's fascinating to look at the data, you know, is, are we seeing a resurgence in these small donors? I mean, that's been one of the speculations that a lot of people have, that perhaps the extension of the universal deduction, allowing people to take $300 um, as a write-off, perhaps that did make a difference, did it or not. Um, Amir, I know I'm gonna come back and ask all the researchers at your school that question, so please prepare them that we need the answers. Um, but, you know, sharing that is hugely important. And part of what we do, in addition to you know just looking at that data, is tell the stories. What did nonprofits themselves see? You know, a lot of people, um, as you know, gave their stimulus checks to charities. So we talked to them about what you know, what kinds of groups were they supporting? What motivated them? Telling those stories helps encourage other people to give um, and shows lawmakers how government money trickles into the communities, maybe in unexpected ways. Right, and and I think that that'd be a great service because in in my anecdotal sense is that many lawmakers don't know enough about the big gifts, the middle gifts, or even the voluntary, the, the upsurge mm -hmm. of mutual aid societies, for example, during the pandemic. There was just a, kind of an ignorance about the importance of this uh, sector that you cover so well across various dimensions uh, uh, of both um, participation and, and revenue and all these things. So I think that was a, a very interesting um, um, uh, suggestion there. Um, You've been very generous with your time, and uh, and we're indebted, indebted to you to for, for providing so much of the material that that uh, fuels the conversations we have about our sector and where it's going. And and as we always look to you, you and your colleagues um, to to provide stimulation and context for us. What it, where what do, and maybe you don't have time to do this, but what do you read uh, to to keep abreast of what's important in your world? You know, who do you follow? Who do you think has interesting kind of long form speculative or or uh, or investigative pieces that you follow that gives you um, the perspective that you need to to put out the chronicle? Yeah. So you can probably see a lot of the things that we're reading if you subscribe to Philanthropy Today. You'll notice. Um, the wide range of sources that we have. So we look at the you know, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and I, I just love reading how the nonprofit world is being covered by the mainstream press. So you know, I devour those kinds of things and also just to know what's going on in the world, but also magazines that are doing terrific work um, and really being able to stay in touch with them. So you know, magazines like The Atlantic, of course, are really important to help shape how we think about the kinds of coverage we're doing, you know, we care deeply about big ideas, so we want to be able to pay attention to them. And then there's also time for books as well. And I would say one of the things I love about the pandemic is that I have had more time just to get through an entire book or listen to a lecture online or do some of those kinds of things that there wasn't as much time for um, in the old world. So um, I, I look forward to the days when we can all travel and be with each other in person. But there have been do you have any, do you have any book recommendations for us? Um, I just finished Obama's memoir, and I have to say, I just enjoyed that greatly to really sort of feel, you feel like you're living in the White House, and as a Washingtonian, it's really great to, you know, he'll have moments where you realize, you know, you were 15 minutes away from something that he was doing, because he really brings it to life so well. Um, he's just a marvelous writer. Um, I don't usually go for that kind of thing, but I will recommend that just as a marvelous writer. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. On, on, on another front in terms of recommendations, you know, we've all been looking for ways to cope with what is hopefully the late pandemic phase uh, and, and how to deal with unplugging, or recovering or self-care or kind of managing stress. What, what, what do you do to manage the stress of our current predicament? And I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, one of the areas of reporting that we've done, we actually, my colleague Margie Glennon went to some experts who run you know, trauma groups to sort of say, what are you doing for your own staff? How do you respond to that? So we asked the experts about how they were treating their staff and really making clear how important it is to unplug. These are just very difficult times for all of us, especially for the people who are on the front lines of providing services. You've probably seen some of the coverage we've done of you know, the real challenges that nonprofit workers have faced. Um, at the same time in their personal lives, you know, they've been facing the challenges of educating their children at home. Um, unfortunately, you know, so many of us have had losses uh, because of the COVID crisis. So, you know, I, that mental health toll is something I'm very, very worried about. Um, will it drive people out of the nonprofit world because it's just too much um, and it's been too painful? 
Um, and can we adjust our ways of working? So I think about that a lot in terms of actually practicing what I learn from what we say, not always as easy um, to do, but I think it is like, you know, one of the things that I love about living here in Washington is it's a wonderful walkable city. Um, and so getting out and being able to enjoy, we've had the beautiful cherry blossoms and see the monuments and sort of connect yourself back to the space. Everybody else is out at the same time too. And as long as you can keep your social distance, it's pretty wonderful to be able to feel more engaged with humanity when we've all been sort of locked in our apartments. So those are the kinds of things that always lift my spirits. Um, if I can get out for a long walk, maybe listen to a podcast, but really just watch the people um, and be reminded of what kinds of things I wanna come back to. Absolutely, it's so nice to see each other in three dimensions, uh, even though it's a little disorienting uh, at times as well. And I appreciate you bringing up the, the stressful work of the people, um, of, of, of those of us who are on the front lines and do a lot of the helping work and the caring work. And there is a lot of stress stress involved in, in the world of doing good. Before I thank you for the, your, your generosity and your time and, and your insights, is there anything that you wish I had asked you that I, that I didn't? Uh, you asked me wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. One thing I would like to just let everybody in the audience know is that we really depend on the ideas that come from you. So if you have a story idea or an idea for an opinion piece or those kinds of things, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you know, you can, we have email addresses on our site that you can use to figure out how to contact, what kinds of stories we want, depending on those kinds of things. There's a contact us at the very bottom of the site. Um, and if there's something that you're having trouble finding, you know, feel free to tweet at me and I'll probably come right back at you and tell you something that you can do and point you in a direction. And you can also use the telephone. Um, we're, we, we appreciate that as well. So people don't use that as much as they used to, but that's another way to reach out to us. All those things are available on our website so that you can find that. But please know how much we depend on the people across the country and around the world to tell us what's going on. We are a small staff, we have 11 reporters um, and, you know, we are not able to stay on top of all of the things that we need to be on top of. So we value the insights that everybody gives. And I, I will give a special shout out to the folks um, you work with, Amir. They have always been outstanding at letting us know what's going on. Um, that, that helps us tremendously because we wanna share what are scholars learning? What is the research telling us? What are the great insights? Um, so we really appreciate that greatly. Well, Stacy, I would have thought you had at least 110 reporters given the, the quality. <laughs> they are really good. So can I just do a shout out for all of them? They are outstanding and they have worked really hard this year, especially under very difficult circumstances. It's the best story we've ever covered, probably in terms of being the most interesting and important, I would say in the 30 years we've been doing this more than 30 years, um, but it's been hard. Um, and I can't wait till more of them are back in the newsroom so I can say that to them in person. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a wonderful note uh, for us to conclude on, um, a, a one of gratitude. So, uh, uh, Stacy, thank you for a stimulating and illuminating conversation. And thank you uh, for many of the part, uh, for all of the, those of you who have participated on, on Zoom and helped us to explore some uh, new perspectives on philanthropy. Uh, in the vein of being open uh, that Stacy mentioned, if you have any ideas for us in terms of hopefully what we will call post-pandemic events uh, yeah. in, in the fall going forward, please do let us know. Um, we are keen to provide a deeper perspective on, on the world um, that we work and live in. Finally, we also want to invite all of you to return on April 28th for an event titled The Promise of Gratitude to Revive American Civil Life, uh, Civic Life when we'll discuss how gratitude might invigorate American civic life and lend more meaning to our lives. Uh, you can register on the events tab of our website. So once again, Stacy, thank you so much. Uh, good luck with your great work and we will see you in the newsletters online and in the print version as well. Thank you all very much and have a great and safe day. Thank you. Thank you.